Imagine for a moment that we could shrink ourselves down to the tiniest scale imaginable, smaller than a grain of sand, smaller even than a cell in your body, until we enter the realm where the building blocks of the universe itself begin to emerge. This is the world of particles, the unseen foundations of everything around us. From the air we breathe to the sun lighting up our sky. In the last episode, we looked at the scale of atoms and molecules, discovering that they were on a scale 10 billion times smaller than you or me. And this now leads us on to a basic explanation of how they interact and form the world around us. Welcome to the Particle Model. The Particle Model is one of the simplest yet most profound ideas in chemistry. It tells us that all matter, everything that you can see, touch or feel, is made up of tiny, discrete particles. The model isn't overly complex and doesn't really deal with what these particles actually are, but simplifies them and imagines them to be tiny, hard spheres. Now, we know that that is not exactly true, but that doesn't stop the particle model being useful in helping us to understand how the various states of matter interact and change. In fact, this is what science means when we say we have a model of some aspect of reality. We're not saying that reality works exactly like this. We're just saying that it allows us to make some useful predictions about what is likely to happen in certain situations. So, let's take a bit of a closer look at this particle model. What it says and what it allows us to predict about the way matter behaves. In the particle model, the particles, whether they're atoms, molecules or ions, are constantly moving, interacting and reshaping the world in ways we can't see, but we can understand. Picture a solid, like this table, or the desk you're resting your hands on, or this cup and spoon in front of me. On a microscopic scale, their particles are tightly packed vibrating in place, but packed far too tightly together to change positions, like dancers packed into a rock concert. In our model, strong forces hold these particles together and prevent them from straying away from their fixed positions. Now, imagine a liquid, perhaps the water in this kettle. The particles are freer, sliding past one another in a graceful, flowing motion. This allows the group of particles to change its shape. But because the particles are still held together with strong forces, it cannot change its volume. It's a bit like that crowd of concept goers arriving at the stadium. And finally, think of a gas, like the air that surrounds us, or the steam rising from this cup of coffee. The particles zoom chaotically, colliding and scattering at incredible speeds. There are very few attractive forces between these particles, and so they spread out in all directions, filling all available space. But why does this view of reality matter? Why should we care about particles? The answer is that by understanding their behaviour, we can unlock the secrets of everything from why ice melts to how rockets launch into space. The particle model is like a map into this invisible world. It allows us to predict, explain and manipulate the very fabric of the world around us. It is certainly useful, but how accurate is it? And why do we use it? Let's start with a closer look at how the properties of liquids are explained by the particle model. When a substance is in a liquid state, 
we expect it to have certain properties. Look at the water in this beaker. It has a level top surface. As I pour it from one container to another, it takes the shape of the new container. Notice that the volume remains fixed. The 100 centimeters cubed of water I had in this beaker remains the same when shared out into these two smaller beakers. And once again, the top surfaces are now level. Now, the particle model suggests that water can be modeled as a collection of tiny spheres. In reality, these are the water molecules, each around 0.3 nanometers across. But we should be able to get something similar with these small spheres. These balls are each around five millimeters in diameter, which is many millions of times larger than a water molecule. But you will see that they can have very similar behaviors. This top level of spheres is approximately level. I can move the spheres around and even displace them with my finger, just like water molecules moving out of the way when you get into the mouth. When I pull them from one beaker to another, they move freely. And again, the spheres together will take the shape of their new container, while retaining their original total volume. Now, if there were strong forces between these spheres, perhaps I glued them together so they couldn't move, they would behave like particles in the solid state. Their collective shape would be fixed, and even if I tipped them out of the container, they would be locked in place, just like the water molecules in an ice cube. In fact, they aren't just locked together in place, but they order themselves into a repetitive pattern. So what about the transition to the gas state? Well, keep in mind that the particles are always moving a bit. In solids, they're vibrating in place, but in liquids, they're actually always sliding past each other in a constant dance. So every so often, one of those particles near the liquid surface is going to get knocked just a little bit too firmly, and any attractive forces it feels could be overcome, and as a result, it could be thrown out of the group and off into the atmosphere. It has evaporated and is now in the gas state. The harder I shake this beaker of plastic spheres, the more kinetic energy they have. More and more of the little balls are knocked out of the beaker, and this is just like a puddle of water evaporating away more quickly on a warm day. Now, we've touched on an important point here. The concept we call temperature is really linked to the average kinetic energy of the particles. However, substances change their state at different temperatures. For example, water changes from a gas to a liquid or vice versa at 100 degrees centigrade, while iron remains solid until 1538 degrees centigrade. Why should that be? Well, remember those forces of attraction between the particles. They have different strengths in different substances, and so more or less energy is required to overcome them. The particles in iron simply require much more thermal energy to separate them than those of the water in my glass. In the GCSE chemistry course, we will look at the different ways particles are held together, and we will explain those differences in melting and boiling points. But this is also a good time to talk about that word, particle. It is far too general a term for what we are going to need when we explain those differences between water and iron. So far, we have used it to mean the smallest possible part of the substance. In reality, that might be an atom, for example, 
helium in a balloon. A molecule, such as the H2O molecules in a glass of water. Or the ions in a crystal of salt. We will look at all of these substances in detail over the GCSE chemistry course. But as we take our first steps into this microscopic world, keep in mind that what may seem ordinary, like a drop of water or a gust of wind, is actually extraordinary. It is the balance of fundamental forces interacting with particles that are often less than one nanometer across. And this journey all starts with the humble particle.